This podcast was brought to you by the book Alchemy of the Mind by Vanita Daya. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining me on the line today from Melbourne, Australia, is Vanita Dahia, who's an integrative medicine clinical consultant pharmacist, naturopath, and clinical nutritionist, board certified fellow in anti aging and regenerative medicine, providing clinical training programs and educational initiatives to doctors and allied health practitioners. Vanita is a functional pathology clinical consultant and health services manager, providing in-depth technical and clinical consultancy and expert technical training, incorporating assessment, interpretation and prescriptive guidelines to doctors and allied healthcare practitioners internationally. Vanita is a medical authority and extraordinary mentor for, to her peers and patients alike, and as a presenter to her peers and community at large, she is engaging, articulate, humorous and insightful. And I've known Vanita for many years, many, many years. Today, we're going to be talking with Vanita about the science of love, lust, and sex. So, Vanita, I'd like to warmly welcome you to FX Medicine. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. This is quite a hot topic (laughs) because it actually guides us through um, life, particularly with um, you know, very powerful, powerful politicians out there. They often become unstuck when they're exposed to uh, promiscuous <laughs> activities. <laughs> I, I, I don't think there would be many people in the world who aren't governed or guided by their libido in some way, shape or form throughout their lives. Absolutely. Well, you know, if you think about it, about most of our life energy is actually spent in either pursuing or avoiding sex. <laughs> <laughs> now, why would we be avoiding? Hmm. So let's go into <laughs> libido. Why, you know, it's it's a big topic, particularly as we age, but I've also noticed, you know, amongst friends and, and colleagues and, you know, when we have discussions about this, that it seems to affect men and women at different stages in their life, sometimes, um, you know, disconcordantly. Why is this so? What's happening? Well, the two major players, when we're talking about libido, it's really, from a chemical perspective, it's really about, libido is all about sex hormones Mm. and about neurotransmitters. And anything that blocks the production of neurotransmitters or sex hormones is going to affect libido or sex drive. Now, obviously, as we age, our hormones decline with age and the hormones fluctuate throughout one cycle whether it's menopause or PMS or perimenopause, etc. But major simple factors, just something as simple as diet, plays such a vital role in the manufacture of neurochemicals as well as sex hormones. After all, diet or our protein is um, the precursor to manufacture of our neurotransmitters. Yes. And they play such a vital role. They play with the hormones. And then the other thing too is, Something as simple as exercise. We don't do enough exercise. A lot of us either do too much or too little of it. And exercise is necessary to oxygenate the system. It's it's necessary to get the blood flowing, get the endorphins flowing, etc. And people who have a high level of oxygenation in their system will have a higher drive, energy drive, and that'll play a role in libido as well. I've often said that uh, men don't get enough exercise, and one of two of the exercises they should be doing more of is bending over and stacking the dishwasher and reaching <laughs> up and hanging up the shirts, and that will affect the biochemistry of the female. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. That'll get some of the oxytocin flowing, knowing full well that the men can get involved in domestics as well. <laughs> yeah. I can I can just hear my wife when she listens to this podcast saying, yeah, start walking your talk, son. But, <laughs> yeah. But, but, but I've, got to, I've got to ask first, what my wife and I have had a lot of discussions on this regarding our friends and indeed our relationship, in, particularly in the early days, that 
that there was this disconcordance, there was this disconnect sometimes when some one of the couple had a high libido and the other one had a low libido. And this might have changed with regards to pregnancy. And, you know, we've spoken to a lot of women with regards to what happens around the time of their periods. Um, I've said after pregnancy, child rearing, but then in on the reverse sense with the male, there's certain times when a male's libido is high and then spoken to other colleagues, for instance, where the, the, the male is more interested in footy and fishing. And, you know, the woman has to really go all out to try and, uh, you know, incite some interest, if you like. So why is there this disconcordance, this disconnect between the male and the female? When a, when a woman goes through any changes in their life, and this is this is all about hormones. So progesterone and estrogen change throughout one cycle. Now, in a cycle itself, a woman's progesterone will peak in the luteal phase and an estrogen will peak in ovulation and just before period. So when there is an imbalance of both progesterone and estrogen, they create changes like progesterone deficiency or estrogen dominance. That happens in a female. But in a male, you'll happen to see that your androgens, particularly as a man ages, androgens shift. Mm. They shift into becoming estrogen dominant. Mm. In other words, they get the pot belly, they get the receding hairline, they, you know, they, their muscles become flaccid. But they are drivers that actually send these signals out to the system. Something as simple as stress, everybody is exposed to stress. Mm. When we're very stressed, your catecholamines are released. Obviously, upregulation of cortisol stimulates catecholamine release. And the catecholamine, this is your adrenaline rush, your flight, flight, freeze response. Now, we know that sex is really a parasympathetic dominant activity. But when the body is under a lot of stress, what actually happens is that the adrenaline and noradrenaline, it gets pushed up, creating anxiety, um, stimulating uh, metabolism, it then starts to mop up all the glucose in the body and it then creates a feeling of, I guess what you could call brain starvation. Mm. And so the brain looks for, and this is part and parcel of insulin up and down regulation and the same applies to serotonin. As insulin goes up, serotonin goes up and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So we know that the your sympathetic and your parasympathetic systems, look, your 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 central nervous system is the global controller of both the sympathetic and parasympathetic yes. nervous system, right? And we know that we need the sympathetic nervous system to drive the ejaculation. We need the parasympathetic nervous system to stimulate erection. And we also know that when you know when you eat your parasympathetic system goes up. That doesn't mean that you get an erection. <laughs> it's, it's, you, your nervous system plays a role for sure, but there, it's not the only factor. <laughs> there are so many pictures going through my mind right now, Vanita. <laughs> but but what about libido waning as life goes on? Like, surely there's got to be peaks and troughs. But in general, there is this. You know, one would like to think there's an elegant exit to stage left. But there seems to be this real issue in modern day society of a waning libido. There seems to be a waning libido because of the fact that we are so much more attuned to neurological imbalances. Right. The nervous system talks to the sex hormones. So it's not only about, you know, we, we're talking about sex as a, it's a natural thing, really. Um, Absolutely. It's 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 nature's trick to reproduce, and and we actually have what we live our lives in duality, and that's what sex is all about. We have light and dark, we have male and female, we have yin and yang, and that duality is is what we call when the duality meets, we call that sex. Now, in the young, our intelligence is actually hijacked by hormones, and we call that physical sex. Mm. And as we age, our intelligence is hijacked by emotion, and that's what we call love. But as we get older, much older, then we seek other levels of awareness. And that could be seeking you know, the meaning of life or the divine, etc. 
So really, when we're identifying with sex, we're identifying. It's a natural thing. So we identify. We need to stop decorating it and feel inadequate about it. Because the moment you need to add decorations like emotion, then sex doesn't become a natural thing. But I do like your description there about, you know, sex versus love, you know, um, and then even the the follow-on from there to companionship, this sort of emotional sort of play. That was really elegant. That was really nice. You, you've mentioned the hormones, you know, talk to the neurotransmitters and vice versa. Is sex and libido not all about hormones? What's the science behind love and sex? Well, let's have a look at some of the science behind falling in love. When you, um, when you fall in love, there's an excitation, there's lust, there's obsessive thoughts, there's an addiction that dominates. And all it involves is release of certain neurochemicals. There's a flood of endorphins. When you fall in love, there's the flood of endorphins and neurochemicals such as oxytocin, vasopressin, and dopamine are released. Like when you kiss, your, your neurotransmitters like phenolethylamine, this is the stuff that goes up when we eat chocolate and yep, feel eat, nice yep. and relaxed. <laughs> your endorphins, dopamine, they released from the brain's cortex. So the nerve endings in your lips become more sensitive and they fire signals oh. back to the brain's cortex to release these hormones. Phenolethylamine is actually released not only when you eat chocolate, but it actually acts as a releasing agent of nor adrenaline and dopamine. So that gives you the dopamine is so important. When we use um, antidepressants like SSRIs, often they say their, their libido is stunted or mm. blunted. Mm. And the reason being is that we're often bar barking up the wrong tree. Patients who are serotonin deficient need SSRIs, but a lot of patients have this lack of dopamine. They actually feel rather... Um, they, they have symptoms of low dopamine, lack of satisfaction, lack of motivation, and they translate that as depression. Now, I'm, I'm just so, going off on a, on a tangent here, off, on, mm. off from sex, but with regards to depression. And I'm wondering about the facility then of the newer class of antidepressants, the SS, sorry, the SNRIs. SNRIs, yeah. Um, yeah. So do they sort of tend to have a less impact on lowering libido? They would have the same level of side effect profiles as an SSRI, right. but they may be slightly different in different degrees. It is important that we need to recognize that these neurotransmitters, just like hormones, work in harmony, like an orchestra. Mm. The moment you put progesterone into the soup of, neuro, uh, of hormones, sex hormones, you're going to alter all the other hormones as well. So it's important when you're using an SSRI or SNRI, you're supporting two particular pathways. Often you need to support all of the pathways. We're not looking at GABA nor adrenaline, adrenaline, etc. And they all need to be in balance. Because these neurotransmitters play such a vital role in talking to other hormones. For example, progesterone. As we age, progesterone depletes. Yep. And as progesterone depletes, we have symptoms. Look, progesterone, we know it's used in dysmenorrhea, it's used in irregular cycle, it's associated with infertility, etc. But the way it talks to neurotransmitters if we have a low progesterone, particularly as we age, it will. It, progesterone is a GABA stimulator. It stimulates GABA A receptors. So as we have a low progesterone, you will see a low GABA, and that leads to anxiety. As you have a low progesterone, you will see low serotonin, and this relates to low mood. As you have a low progesterone, you will have low dopamine, and this is associated with your breast tenderness and fluid retention. And it also lowers your beta endorphins, and this allows for cravings. This is why women premenopausally or premenstrually go through cravings. They need to have their sugar and their, and their um, salt fix. And they also have an increased pain sensitivity during that time. So your hormones play a direct role with your neurotransmitters. Can I ask a 
question, and this may be again off topic again, and forgive my mind, but I just keep coming up with these sort of clinical situations. So you mentioned there about when you've got low progesterone that you have lowered dopamine. Does that automatically mean high, proge- high prolactin in low progesterone states? There is, there is a direct correlation between prolactin, as you well know, prolactin, elevated levels of prolactin are associated with decreased sexual interest, arousal, and orgasm. Yep. And so in women, prolactin, high prolactin is associated with infertility. There's an inverse relationship between prolactin and dopamine. So the higher the prolactin, the lower the dopamine, yeah. the lower the satisfaction, because dopamine inhibits the release of prolactin. Yeah. And where do herbs like progesterogenic herbs fit in? Vitex is an example. It actually stimulates that particular pathway by inhibiting prolactin release and improving dopamine levels. So this is why when somebody is taking progesterone, bioidentical progesterone, or even a herb like Vitex, It'll stimulate that dopaminergic pathway. Not only does it do that, but it also stimulates GABA pathways as well. What's the what's the current um, experience, if you like, of uh, um, Vitex in low dose versus high dose? I seem to recall some older papers talking about a. a a, di- a biphasic response, if you like, from low versus high dose, that one increased progesterone and the other one inhibit the, the one dose inhibited progesterone. Is that correct, or are we have we moved on? There from is that? I, I cannot quote the study that you're referring to, but there is definitely a correlation between dose dependency. Oh, okay. It's actually quite interesting. Whilst you're talking on the topic of a Vitex. Um, they've done a study uh, at Marker uh, in psychopharmacology in 2003. They, they did a study comparing fluoxetine, which is an SSRI, um, with Vitex. And they looked at um, your Hamilton depression scale. Yep. They looked at MD. the 10 daily symptoms, etc. And they found that Vitex compared significantly with your fluoxetine. Wow. It actually it, it actually showed that the Hamilton depression scores were almost on par and your Vitex showed greater improvement in physical symptoms. So that will be associated predominantly with dysmenorrhea and that's where the study was actually done. So is that But why? Vitex doesn't work on its own. It works with, with B6, it works with your uh, you know adrenal herbs etc. It works really well with those. So that um, uh, that was my next point. Was that why I think at one stage there somebody was investigating Vitex combined with St John's wort, is that right for menopausal symptoms or is that it? They generally tend not to use St John's wort because it's an SS, it's supporting serotonin pathways and they're not everybody needs serotonin support. Um they you generally most um commercially available progesterogenic support complex progesterogenic support would contain Vitex together with um, an adrenal support, something like Bithynia or Rhodiola. And obviously your cofactors, B6 is necessary in all avenues. Yes. Yeah. It's quite interesting because Vitex stimulates your dopaminergic pathway as well as the beta-endorphin pathways. A herb like Bithynia, it stimulates GABA as well as the serotonin pathways. And B6 is the cofactor required at every level. You know, glutamate to GABA, tryptophan to serotonin, tyrosine to dopamine. B6 is needed everywhere. Mm. Um, <laughs> it, well, it is. I, I've often said, you know, when you're doing everything right, quote unquote, by the book, and it's just not, the, you know, you're missing one piece of the jigsaw, if you add simply add a very cheap B6, zinc B6 magnesium supplement, it just seems to be that last piece of the jigsaw to fit into place to make everything sort of work, and that's these, you know, hydroxylases and dehydrogenases, these, these enzymes. That's so true, and this is where the, um, the concept of methylation comes into play. Mm. Um, we often find that patients who tend to be rather stressed have neurological issues and invariably will have libido issues. And so we need to have a clear understanding of where these cofactors play such a vital, vital role in these areas. Yeah. You'll find that, you know, herb or your hormones, 
it's funny how these hormones play with, with neurotransmitters. Progesterone, as an example, will suppress the excitatory glutamate level and it enhances GABA. Okay, We know that uh, progesterone acts like alcohol. It stimulates GABA. Right? When, when a woman's first pregnant, her progesterone is increased at least tenfold. Um, production is increased tenfold. And this is why she's feeling so nice and relaxed because the nat- body naturally produces more GABA. But estrogens work totally oppositely. So what they do, estrogens not only stimulate glutamate neurotransmission, so they stimulate glut- glutamate, but, and it does this at the NMDA receptors, and, and that's why estrogens are quite um, helpful in um, learning and memory and concentration because they're improving the synaptic plasticity. Estrogens is, improve? Yes, yes. Estrogens do that. No, not all estrogens. It's estradiol that does that quite effectively. Yeah. Now, estrogen also promotes the dopamine release and that might be mediated by your inhibitory effects of your estrogen release because dopamine terminals, they influence by GABA. So estrogen can actually improve your cognition and mood through modulation of your neurotransmitters, particularly serotonin. Ah. So how, see how they play with each other? It's yeah. fantastic how they play with each other. Yeah. So estrogen's, estrogen's great because they increase the level of serotonin, but they also decrease your 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan reuptake. So it allows for more 5-HTP to remain longer in the synaptic cleft. So it allows for the prolonged effect of estrogen in the synaptic cleft. Right. So, they, you know, they, the two work opposite to each other. So it's important to back, make sure that we're balancing those two. I, I can so see ed- here that there's more than just a seesaw going on. There's swings and roundabouts and it, like you've really got to know what you're talking about. And one thing that I didn't mention when I introduced you, Vanita, is your new book called Alchemy of the Mind. Now, I've, I, I haven't studied this. I've read it or, I, I, let's say, gave, given it a cursory glance. And it's an extremely well set out book. So I've got to say, you know, if people are really interested in learning about these, these interplays between the hormones, get your book and start really learning, doing some learning. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's it's a really great synopsis. Uh, the Alchemy of the Mind was really aimed at um, assisting the reader, whether the reader is a patient or a practitioner, in understanding the metabolic blocks, yeah. the neurochemistries. Often we see that um, you know mental health is just not about neurochemicals. It's all about we need to balance the stress hormones the um, sex hormones and the neurotransmitters together. We need to actually put, validate all the variants that walk through our door when we're looking at ourselves clinically, our libido clinically. Mm. We, need to, we need to establish all the various clinical triggers, find those clusters of symptoms. Is it the gut? Is it, the, is it uh, you know, toxic exposure that is causing some of my mental health concerns. So find those clusters of symptoms. We can't compass, com, sorry, compartmentalize um, uh, the, the body any longer. We actually are working towards an integrative approach and we need to combine all those modalities. And this is what the book's aiming at doing. It's, it's splitting the arms of the, the mind and understanding how the gut affects the mind, how adrenals affect the mind, the thyroid affects the mind, etc. Yeah. Now, when you were talking earlier about, you know, that sort of addictive phase of love, you, you mentioned a very topical hormone, oxytocin. And there was some mm. research, some early research about delivering oxytocin. It was basically called the cuddle hormone. But then there was some research that was saying, oh, I'm not so sure. Where where are we at with the research with oxytocin now? Look, we know that oxy- women produce a lot of oxytocin, particularly postpartum. Um, and it's released in large amounts, particularly during labor and after stimulation of the nipples. And this is really a facilitator for childbirth and breastfeeding. And it's released by the posterior lobe in the pituitary. Now, we know that oxytocin is... It has been quite 
fashionable within compounding pharmacy as a nasal spray to stimulate that cuddle hormone effect. Yeah. So as as um, men become, or rather as as we age, our oxytocin. Women have produce a lot more oxytocin than men, and that's possibly because men have difficulty. They are testosterone dominant and that's probably why women have problems um, maintaining or having an orgasm. And this is part and parcel of the same mechanism. So when you see a woman with oxytocin, that's this cuddle, cuddle hormone, mm. right? When you have Men, men can have a climax so fast, whereas women have a lot of difficulty with orgasms. So orgasms in a female are very, very clinically beneficial for a female, both physically and psychologically, because they ease menstrual cramps and they alleviate the stress. Now, one of the things that is not related to hormones nor neurotransmitters is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is... Um, we, we, we've relate that as a vasodilator and it's used particularly in our cardiovascular issues. So nitric oxide is necessary for penile erections because the mechanism behind that, it actually converts um, uh, guanylate cyclase, which is GTP, to cyclic GMP and it produces an increased blood flow to the penis. So this is very, very, um, the same mechanism is used in our drug called sildenafil, which is used as a, for erectile dysfunction or the Viagra, because it inhibits the metabolism of cyclic GMP. And so in, by doing so, it prolongs the effect of the erection. So if you're looking at serotonin, serotonin constricts the smooth muscle. Adrenaline increases the heart rate. So in women... Adrenaline also increases uh, vaginal pulse amplitude as well. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So therefore, um, if you have somebody who's really stressed, noradrenaline and adrenaline, they will increase arousal. Okay. So this this happens. There's a play of all of these neurotransmitters during a sexual event. So in males, your testosterone influences your sexual interest and behavior, but it has very little impact. The estrogens have very little impact on the sexual desire. Right. So when you have estrogen deficiency as one ages particularly, you might have decrease in, uh, your decrease in genital or vaginal lubrication or vaginal atrophy, and that can also play a role in the level of orgasm. Yeah. So you know how you spoke about oxytocin? Mm. We know oxytocin is produced by dopamine and it's increased on sexual arousal. But in men, that whole bonding effect is quite muted because the male has much higher levels of testosterone. So they don't have that emotional attachment. Ah. They, they do the deed and they go, whereas women would need to um, have that emotional attachment because their oxytocin levels are still rising. Men's oxytocin doesn't. So women would probably, after a sexual um, activity, will want um, you know, the cuddle effect and probably have a long chat, whereas men will just say, look, go away. <laughs> what, what is it? The the men just need a time and a place? <laughs> <laughs> What, what what about that research that showed um, that oxytocin was involved in trust? Is that part of this sexual desire and and you know sort of need for a woman to trust the sexual partner? It was very interesting. Many um, a, a while ago, I had read a paper on what we call neurobunk. and the these neurotransmitters, whether it is or, or and hormones they have a effect of stimulating and inhibiting de- and it's dose dependent. Just as much as you were talking about Vitex and just as much as we're talking about cortisol. At a low level, cortisol could be associated with adrenal fatigue, third stage adrenal dysfunction. At a high level, cortisol could be considered 
to be, um, you know, adrenaline output, high adrenaline output, and yeah. that's stimulatory. And physically and physiologically, the patient may be feeling exactly the same. So the same applies to oxytocin. When you're having oxytocin at a lower or a higher level, it might play a role in not only in cuddle and addictions, etc., but can also play a role in, and this is where uh, in, in adverse addictive aspects or negative emotions. Right. So this is where um, major corporations would use this level of testing. They might use PET scans, they might use QEEGs or um, hormonal measures to identify why a, a, a consumer would um, consume a particular marketable product yep. versus not. And so that's marketing, using neurochemistry as a marketing neurobank. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, so so back to the same question. Your question was oxytocin, good or bad? It can be good or bad, yeah. depending entirely on the setting. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. should we be mucking with it? That's that's my I guess the overall question. And I think part of that is that, you know, corporation sort of thing about you know, this will give you the, the the be all and end all answer to you know, how you achieve orgasm and, and how you enjoy sex, when I think the enjoyment of sex is so much more dependent on men getting off your butt and doing some things around the house and being of use to the, being of, of function to the family unit or, or, or the female at least. Um, uh, and, you know, there are so many other issues that are, inter, are involved with the woman um, you know, n needing to feel secure, not having to have stressors in her life from totally disparate things to be able to concentrate on the act of making love or having sex. Andrew, what what you're saying here is, should we bark up one tree only or should we look at all of them in its entirety? When we have a lack of libido or an, an, a, an impaired sexual function, yeah you do need to look at the clinical triggers. You cannot identify oxytocin as the major clinical um, trigger only. Mm. Mm. It may be of use, but you cannot do it independently of identifying your hormonal dysregulation because they play a vital role. If your testosterone, DHEA are out of balance, you're going to have a poor libido. And, and it's particularly if your progesterone is depleted and you have estrogen dominance, that's going to play a role in libido. If your stress levels are elevated, obviously, as you well know, elevations of stress will stimulate the pregnenolone steel pathway and drive down your DHEA. And that in itself plays a major role, not only in libido, but all other functions as well. That will drive down your neurotransmission pathways. Mm. And as we've expressed, all the neurotransmitters talk to the um, hormones. So we therefore sensibly identify one way to Id identify your clinical trigger is measure hormonal dysregulation, if there is any, and correct that. Now, it can be corrected either through pharmaceutical hormone replacement therapy, bioidentical hormone therapy, which is in Australia is prescription only and it's tailored for the individual and it's compounded in a compounding pharmacy. Yeah. Or herbs. Herbs and nutrients play such a vital role in stimulating and balancing hormones. That is one component. The second component is addressing adrenal function. We cannot, everything is driven by your adrenals. So we do need to support adrenal function. Measure the cortisol. Cortisol is released bionally, so measure the diurnal rhythms. And cortisol plays a direct role. The HPA axis is intimately related to the HPT axis, which is thyroid. So if you've got a bunged up adrenal, you're likely to have a thyroid that doesn't work properly. So that's the first key. And then in conjunction with that, measure neurotransmitters. 
Now, neurotransmitters can be measured quite easily. It can be measured in urine samples, and it can be you measuring your inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitters. And in conjunction with that, you might want to measure histamine and your amino acids, etc., so that you can yep. examine the play of the excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters, balance them up, and having an understanding of the correlation between your herbs as well as your neurotransmitters, correct that. And last resort, if need be, then you could use something like oxytocin. Um, I've covered um, the the urinary assessment of neurotransmitters with your colleague, Beth Bundy, favourite friend of mine. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, we've spoken a little bit about the controversy of this with regards to, I guess, acceptance with mainstream medicine, given that there's no real way of measuring exactly what's happening at the synaptic level um, or even in the CNS, unless you want to do a lumbar puncture, which isn't going to um, meet any sort of criteria for um, intervention, um, mm-hmm. given that it's a serious um, intervention to, to undertake. So, <laughs> Pretty serious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so is there facility or is there any research showing that when you do urinary um, measurement of neurotransmitter metabolites, that they are concordant with an improvement or a, a deleterious um, trend towards either depression or recovering from depression or anxiety or other sort of mood disorders? Is there any correlation, given that it's not a proven thing or you know, causality might be a long way off, but is there any correlation to draw from this? There is a growing body of evidence and we have access to a white paper that validates the use of urinary assessments of neurotransmission pathways and how they correlate to brain chemistries. Um, And I'm happy to share that with our listeners. Great. Um, So that's a white paper and that's very well researched and referenced. So in relation to the evidence behind the validity of neurotransmission pathways. I know from a clinical perspective, I look at neurotransmission pathways and I correct them naturally using amino acids and and the various precursors of the neurotransmitters. And within weeks, my patients tend to improve dramatically. And right. this is using objective now, assessments like HAMD, HAMA. Yeah, that's right. Yep. That's right, yes. Okay. But you can also reassess them and remeasure them, and so you can see how your uh, neurotransmission pathways have improved over the period of time. So you can monitor, use your pathology to monitor the assessments. You can go the next step up, and what has not been done is there is not enough evidence showing changes in um, circadian rhythms, these are energetic mediums, yep. as well as, P, as, as ECG, EEG, sorry, quantitative electroencephalograms yep. or PET scans, etc. There is no direct, that I know of, there may be some art in the making, that I know of that correlates PET scans and changes in neurochemistry with that of the electro um, encephalograms. And I guess that will open up an area as the area of neuroscience, neuroplasticity, and neurochemistry is a growing and a burgeoning science. People are so aware of um, everything to do with the brain these days. So, uh, And there's never been a time that I know of that has been so... Um, rampant in terms of awareness in this area, possibly because the media now, and there are many organizations that acknowledge and um, support mental health issues. Yeah. And they're becoming a major, major issue, particularly in Western societies. It doesn't happen so much in third world countries, but it definitely happens a lot in the Western society. And so as a result of that, there's a burgeoning interest in that area, and I dare say that this level of, of um, assessment and validation needs to be done. And, and I think um, this would be the perfect opportunity for a place like Swinburne University's um, Centre for Human Psychopharmacology. Um, to really be able to do some research or somebody to fund some research into looking at this. It would be awesome to see that 
um, that sort of correlation be proven or indeed disproven, see if there's a, an effect there. That's true. As a matter of fact, at this stage now, just new to our books at the moment is um, I've just come across a um, genetic test that is able to identify uh, a gene uh, mutation mm. associated with mental health disturbances and its correlation to um, prioritizing of specific classes of antidepressants, pharmacological antidepressants or antipsychotics or angiolytics, etc. So uh, your your research in this area definitely needs to be um, done, Mm. particularly in relation to QEG assessments together with neurotransmission pathways and see how that correlates. Absolutely, Vanita. Indeed, I, I remember an old psychology lecturer, Robin Holden, if you're out there, thank you so much for your teachings when I was doing nursing. Um, But I'll always remember a line that she said, and that was, it is probably, it is only a matter of time, probably only decades before it is proven that all mental health disorders are revealed to be of a biochemical nature. And, you know, when we, we, I guess now we sort of think, a duh, (laughs) <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. but back then it wasn't so proven, if you like. And it would, it, I just think if so much more can be done to help people respond to a medicine in a more precise manner, for instance, at the moment, you're basically flipping a coin to see if somebody will respond to an antidepressant. That's um, correct. And yes. there is some skill in the psychologist, forgive me, the psychiatrist prescribing that to say, yes, this sort of symptom picture, you're probably more likely to do better on that sort of medicine. But it's still, it still is a toss of a coin in some manner. It's not a guaranteed. And it would be really interesting to see some more work on genetics to say, well, look, these people with that genetic snip are more likely to respond to this, or conversely, they're more likely to be resistant to that sort of medication. It, it's um, such an important part to be able to personalise medicine. So I guess my next question is, do you find that people with certain genetic SNPs, I guess some are given, things like COMPT, um, would respond or indeed have more of an issue with libido um, if they have a certain SNP in an area like COMPT or methylation or stuff like that? I guess the um, the concept of as you, as you just spoke about neurotransmission pathways, mm. um, I guess the concept of genetic mutations, COMT or MTHFR, all of these markers will play a role in inflammatory markers. So inflammation, interleukin six, TNF alpha, etc. These are inflammation markers that will also play a role in inflammation as a whole. And inflammation, as we well know, is associated with acidity. Acidity is associated with changes in the microbiome. And the microbiome is necessary without probiotics in our gut and without fermented foods in our gut. We can't make neurotransmitters. We can't make GABA, as an example. Our fermented foods make GABA. So just in relation to methylation cofactors and methylation defects, that's one arm. Works of um, Dr. Carl Pfeiffer and Bill Walsh from uh, the Mind Institute, these are really very well published um, authors in the area of um, nutrient deficiencies, the power of nutrients within and here we're relating specifically to zinc copper ratios, identifying um, medicaments or toxic medicaments such as pyrroles in the urine to correlate deficiencies of specific nutrients which relate to specific um, diseases yeah. such as schizophrenia, etc. So when we're opening up the can of worms with neurotransmission pathways, libido and hormones, we do need to understand where the metabolic blocks are. We've, we've just opened up, uh, I guess, one area of neurotransmission pathways, but they also correlate and dr- are driven with nutrients such as zinc, copper, histamine, etc. And 
the concept of over and under methylation, this is where your comp gene comes in, and this is where MTHFR comes in, and this is where your SAMI and your folate cycles come in. They all play a role in inflammatory conditions. And if you have inflammation, you will have pain. You might have a whole host of symptoms that are associated with degeneration of your physiology. And under any circumstances, libido will win automatically. Yeah. So we do need to be mindful of those physiological um, defects, I, I guess we could call them, and rectify them. And they can be easily measurable and they can be easily corrected. And, and there's enough evidence, with, uh, particularly the work from the Mind Institute, enough evidence to show that specific nutrients can play such a vital role in rectifying. Something as simple as vitamin B6 and zinc can rectify neurotransmission pathways yep. to the point where a patient's life is normalized. The mm. libido then starts to kick in. Mm. Vanita, I've got to ask, like, you know, this sort of stuff seems just so second nature to you. You've been a community pharmacist for many years in the past. You've specialised in compounding. You are intimately involved with testing, uh, with functional pathology testing. And so you actually see the results of intervention. But I've got to ask you, when did it click for you? Because this seems like to me, there's there's not just a triangle. There's triangle upon a triangle upon a triangle upon a triangle, so that you end up as as, as if you did one of those, um, you know, weaving things with wrapping wool around nails. You know, you end up with this really complex um, interwoven structure. And I guess where I'm going here is, you know, I primarily want practitioners to be safe and to get successful interventions for their patients. So where should they start? And, you know, I guess what sort of resources would you say that they are, are mandatory for them to undertake before they start intervening in these sort of interventions that you've spoken about? Okay. So the first question you asked is, when did it click for me? I guess I, I think it is important to um, let you know that many, many, many years ago, I, I used a combination, a specific combination of amino acids for somebody who was really, really, really anxious and panicky. You know, she was having, virtually having a heart attack within my uh, compounding pharmacy at the time. And within minutes, she um, calmed down. Wow, minutes. Within minutes. Yes, she calmed down. And um, and that's when I realized that I needed to understand a lot more. So my pet love is amino acids. Mm. I love working with amino acids because I know how to upregulate, prevent the calcium excess and how to um, stimulate various neurotransmission pathways. So having So the next question is where does the listener go out and seek the information? One of the resources that is a really basic um, guide would be the book that I've just written called Absolutely. Alchemy of the Mind. Absolutely. Okay. And that's a good starting point because it's laced with a bunch of checklists and um, and as well as um, lists what that will be associated with up or down regulation of every specific pathway. But in terms of where a listener might be able to learn more is through FX Medicine podcasts <laughs> and through um, your um, integrative medicine teaching bodies, and there are a number of them out there at the moment, and um, and also having clearer understanding of really getting to understanding your labs finding those lab variants, finding out what up and down regulates the lab variants and how they actually talk to each other. Learning about hormones is one thing. Learning about neurotransmitters is another. Mm. But putting them together is the key. Yeah, that's right. And that's, and that's what we, um, we would hopefully be able to provide some more teaching material in due course. Okay, so I guess the next question here, I guess, is a little bit, I hope it's not too much of a devil's advocate um, question, but with regards to safety, how safe are the interventions, nutritional herbal interventions? Um, when do you have to be really cautious and what's their, uh, let's say, a safe window of, um, of use? As a 
nutritional, a nutritionist, naturopath or herbalist, you'd be well aware of the uh, Materia Medica of all your ingredients. Yes, they should. So they should be, <laughs> right? Okay, so so it's, it's very important to note that herbs and vitamins and nutrients are as almost as powerful as pharmacological interventions. And they also have their own materia medica associated with adverse reactions, side effects, etc. They generally, um, overall, are much safer than pharmacological interventions. But it is important to understand that there are contraindications. So things like rhodiola, which is a typical herb used for um, adrenal support, brilliant for adrenal support. It's contraindicated in bipolar disorders. Licorice, as you well know, again, another herb that is really brilliant for adrenal function is uh, contraindicated in uh, renal insufficiency and cardiovascular disease and so forth and so on. So they all have their... Um, their value, hmm. and so it's they, they practitioners need to use their expertise in identifying the correct dosage and the safety of their supplementation based on their professionalism. Yeah, and I think that this sort of ties intimately in with the um, the toxicologist axiom, and that is that everything is toxic. Is toxic. It's merely the dose. It's the yeah, yeah, so that too much awesome. water. If you drink water all day, that will also be damaging to your body. Yeah, <laughs> Benita, you know, like we could podcast, we could seriously talk on this for hours and not even scratch the surface. There is so much to cover here. Um, so I would just suggest get your book, delve further into learning from organizations and associations like, for instance, ACNEM, A5M, things like that, IFM overseas. Um, and uh, become an expert in this sort of thing. But I, I really do. Like, I, I've got to say, I was so impressed with the set out of your book. It was really nice, clear, concise, and well-minded in its approach to where, the, where you know, sort of what um, effect you want to get. Yeah, thanks. Vanita, thanks, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us on FX Medicine today. It's been great. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This podcast was brought to you by the book Alchemy of the Mind by Vanita Dyer.